before we get started. Okay, great. I think we can get started. Hello everyone, my name is Audrey Bullis. I'm the Senior Programs and Communications Associate at the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy, also known as Time Up. It's our pleasure to welcome you to our newest virtual panel, The Cycle of LGBTQ Socioeconomic Inequality in the MENA Region. As countries across the Middle East and North Africa confront staggering economic crises, the myriad existing inequalities and injustices that LGBTQ people face are further exacerbated. In combination with deteriorating economic conditions, underlying, access, underlying issues of access to quality education, in addition to their marginalized status, can seriously limit employment options for LGBTQ people in the region, leading to prolonged financial instability. And without stable income or employment opportunities, members of the community are rendered increasingly vulnerable to social and state harassment as they're often forced to work odd jobs that increase their vulnerability, creating a cycle of entrenched marginalization. So we're excited to host a panel discussion today that will delve into some frameworks that entrench LGBTQ discrimination, the impact of their marginalization in the economy, and pathways to meaningful integration of queer people socially, economically, and holistically. Before we begin, I want to quickly remind our audience of a couple of things. As always, today's conversation is being recorded and will be shared widely after the panel. You can follow along and live tweet with us using the hashtag TimeUpEvents, and we encourage and invite our audience to submit questions using Zoom's Q&A function at any point during the panel. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Sophie Shemas. Dr. Sophie is a lecturer in gender studies at SOAS, University of London. Their research sits at the intersection of feminist and queer political theory, Middle East studies, political economy, and cultural studies. Sophie, the floor is yours. Um, thanks so much, Audrey. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you to the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy for putting together this really important um, event. We've got um, four uh, wonderful speakers with us today. So I'll begin by introducing each of our speakers and then posing um, a question for all of them to answer, um, and then we'll take it from there. Um, so first off, we have Hussein Shaito. Um, Hussein is a former non-resident fellow at the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy, focusing on governance and economic development in Lebanon. He's a development economics economist at the Policy Initiative, a Beirut-based research center that aims to empirically assess existing policies and generate viable alternatives. We also have Noura Nurallah, um, who is a non-resident fellow at Time Up, focusing on gender and sexuality in the Middle East and North Africa region. She's also the Institute's first Sada Higazi fellow. Um, we also have Wima, uh, Wima Askri, um, who is a non-binary queer activist from Tunisia. They joined the NGO, the initiative Maljoudin for Equality in 2019 as coordinator of the Maljoudin Queer Film Festival in its third edition, which took place last September, 2022. Uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Lamia Al-Ash'ari, um, who is a Moroccan sociologist, expert in gender equality and sexual diversity. Lamia studies political and cultural-based approaches with relation to discrimination um, and inequalities. So welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to start off with a general question um, for all of you. And so whoever would like to respond first, feel free to jump in. But I thought we could start off um, by um, talking about the um, the ways in which mainstream dis discourses tend to focus on um, culture, religion, and tradition when trying to make sense of and frame the oppression of LGBT communities in the MENA. Um, so, you know, I'd like to hear from you what you think, what you make of this approach and why an analytical shift to the political and the economic um, instead of the cultural or the religious um, might be important when it comes to studying um, the lives of LGBT people in the Middle East. Um, so would anybody like to jump in? Um, yeah, sure, I can, um, can, I can do that. Thank you so much for the introduction and I'm very happy to be present on this panel. Um, so I'm gonna speak on Lebanon a bit uh, when it comes to this uh, issue of you know, shifting discourses. I think, uh, yes, we've seen our fair share of, you know, 
uh, activism that focuses so much on uh, how do we adapt to a certain culture or how do we, you know, enact cultural policies that would ease, you know, this idea of queerness in society. And clearly these, these policies have not been working. I think this is particularly because in the case of Lebanon, the uh, the political system is a highly sectarianized, highly uh, high, so highly sectarianized system that is based on you know clientelism, based on familial uh, ideas of how a society should function. So I think this is the starting point of this. This should be the starting point of the conversation that uh, this is there is a contextual issue that's being ignored by these discourses. Um, in a country where there is more more than ten political parties that are controlling most of the resources, economic, financial uh, resources in the country, uh, I think it would be uh, a bit reductionist to kind of just focus on religion and tradition, which are very important and are very are core components of the struggle, uh, without really taking into account, uh, you know, the fact that there are there is an intersectional way of viewing queer liberation. Uh, this can be either by race, by class, by sexuality, etc. Which kind of brings me to uh, this point of uh, the urgency to really, when we're doing a, re a reading of the Lebanese economy or a reading of MENA economies in general, there is a very uh, urgent need to kind of queer those readings. So, for example, thinking of how um, in highly sectorianized societies, and highly privatized economies, uh, there is a very strong tendency of capitalist exploitation of these groups of people and the commodification of these groups of people, meaning that uh, if, they are, if they do not serve a marketized or an economic purpose, um, they will be considered vices and they will be portrayed as vices. Um, and also, I think one, uh, one uh, kind of unfortunate downside that we, and it's kind of, uh, making this whole idea of you know penetrating very oppressive political system is even more harder in Lebanon is this idea of uh, you know that we've seen a rise in homo nationalism in Lebanon meaning that some emerging political parties uh, or not merging but political uh, traditional political parties with more progressive political ideology that are, are being propagated recently are in a way kind of co-opting this movement because they they have been benefiting from these outdated discourses. So I think it's just to kind of uh, summarize a bit. I think uh, we have enough evidence that this highly sectorianized society, this highly, uh, highly capital intensive society, which now have kind of collapsed following the crisis, um, is enough evidence to you know try and a bit shift from this uh, very very uh, I think cultural understanding of liberation and move to something that actually acknowledges the realities. So for example, just in, in brief, I think in Lebanon, the country's oligarchy, which kind of comprises the actual government and the banking sector and commercial banks have worked together to basically, basically accumulate wealth off of the most vulnerable in society, which includes queer people and it includes queer people across the race, uh, sorry, across the income spectrum. And together, they actually, because of this sectorianized, sectorianized nature of, of the economy, um, they were able to architect a financial Ponzi scheme, which rid the majority of people from their jobs, from their incomes, and uh, the majority of the expenditure of the Lebanese government, so more than 50% went into personal costs, public, none went into, very little went into necessary social protection systems. Um, uh, and eventually the, this, the result of this economic model was a complete collapse that even exacerbated, you know, uh, the livelihoods of a lot of queer people, uh, especially trans folk um, and, 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 and the country. And I think part of, just to conclude, I think part of why uh, this, the, the, the mainstream discourse you mentioned, Sophie, is so dangerous is that even today when all social and economic institutions have entirely collapsed, we are still trying to propagate this idea that maybe if we try to ease queer people, uh, the idea of being queer into the culture that we could get there. And I think, I think it's, we're very far off uh, if we follow this, this kind of discourse. Because right now the crisis continues and these people are co continuously being vulnerabilized. So, you know, so yeah, definitely uh, we need a shift.
Thanks so much, Jason. Um, those are all very important points, a lot of which we'll also be able to return to in a little bit more depth um, um, further on the conversation. Um, uh, Lamia, Nura, Wima, do any of you want to weigh in on this particular question? Yeah, sure. Like I can like take it from uh, Hussein and add like for for years, for decades, like we have been like uh, following a Western gaze into the victimhood of LGBT people in the region. So we did not have any conversations about like the socio, like the political and economic aspects. We mostly focus on like the victimhood, criminalization, we are being attacked, we're being hunted and so on. But we forget that there is something very important like in our context and in Egypt especially, that we are countries that are rigged with corruption. And in a corrupted country where it's a, like a state and institutions basically answer for money and connections, this money and connection means that there is queers who are really protected, like does not have anything to do with them. But the word LGBT community itself is delusional. It creates this illusion that like we're all one concrete group of people facing the same issues. No, it all depends on your uh, on your economic status and your connections and so on and how you are perceived in life. So like it's very important to keep that in mind because economic empowerment in our region equals human rights, like human rights protection. Like it's equal human rights protection more than changing the law, I, I would believe. Like you can wake up and like decide to decriminalize in like country X, but society and the police will still find ways to attack you and like so on. It's like economic empowerment is the way forward and like, and if you take this example and like look in our context, where currently we are all going through economic crises and so on, uh, there is the marginalized societies such as transgender people who are left in the dust basically because they already did not have access to the, uh, the employment market. They did not have access to any of that uh, because of their identity and so on. But also not to generalize, there's still like rich transgender people who travel abroad, do the surgeries, go back, live in the comfort and protection of the, of like, connections and, and like family. But uh, of course, it's very important to have this intersectional approach, and intersectional understanding of how things are perceived, especially in the current economic situation in most of the countries in the region, like especially Egypt. If you look at Egypt currently, we're going through an economic crisis that's hitting everyone hard. So how are we as like LGBT people are taking it? How is this is impacting further our marginalization and decline of human rights and so on? And you need to understand that this is just one aspect, like, you know, like education also, like it all starts with education. If you don't get education, you're not going to get employment. Uh, you're going to, it's going to all like leads into further marginalization. So it's time for us to stop having the Western gaze and have our context gaze more or less. We're not Westernized. Like we're not some intellectual elitists. We're all from these communities and we understand these dangers and we understand this intersectionality. So this Western gaze does not work in our context. We need to have intersectional gaze based on our own community needs and like echo their voices and how we perceive things in the region. And I think a lot of people know when you talk to queer people in the region from uh, middle and lower classes, the biggest threat for them is not like being attacked is a threat, but it's always like economic uncertainty. Like how, uh, how am I gonna survive without like an income? How am I gonna like proceed further in life without an income and so on? So it's very important to have this conversation uh, just to like branch out from the regular conversations that we always have on LGBT rights in the region. Uh, thank you, Nora, for those brilliant points. Um, uh, oh, Wima, come in. Yeah, I think I understood the the question differently than uh, Poseidon and Nora, because I see it uh, in a different aspect. Since here we're talking about advocacy and the mainstream discourse, it also depends on your target, on who you're targeting with your work, on who you're having these conversations with. So, for example, if we in Tunisia we go and talk to the big public, the great public, and talking about economic empowerment, um, the response that we will get is that everybody is like living in misery, basically. Talking about the political freedom, everybody would talk about the current situation and how that is not uh, possible anymore, I would say. So if we're targeting the general public, 
I would say it's very important to, to focus on the culture aspect because that's what makes us us in a sense. But then if we're targeting um, political people, if we're targeting higher people, then the, we will need to change our discourse and what we're talking about. We thought once, for example, Mojadine to prepare a study and to, to show how much the government actually spends money when they're targeting the queer community and arresting the queer community, how much money is actually spent that's not necessarily and it doesn't make any sense. So um, here I would say yes, intersectionality. Yes, everything needs to, to be present at the same time. Yes, we need to focus on everything. But again, um, it's really important to focus on who we are approaching exactly and how we need to approach these people. Uh, thanks, Wima. Um, I was just going to say uh, briefly, and then I'll come to you, Lamia, that I think that, you know, what Noura is saying and what Wima is saying, I think are com compatible, actually, um, arguments. I think it's this idea of, you know, cultural discourses are weaponized by the state, um, but the kind of root cause of, or the, but, but more often than not, queer phobia is a distraction, right? It's a, it's a weapon to distract from um political and economic policies um, um, that are affecting the 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 sort of the the country at large or the region at large, right? But I think that, and I think this point about intersectionality, I think, is also to think about the limits of certain arguments re-decriminalization, right? So if you look at a context like India, the de decriminalization of same-sex relations did not benefit um, people from other marginalized backgrounds, so people who were um, a queer and Muslim, for example, or queer and lower caste, right? So I think there are these are compatible um, um, arguments in terms of you know who a particular discourse is aimed at. But I think having that context of why queer phobia happens in the first place and who is actually most affected by that queer phobia is then is important in terms of the the larger picture. I think for then shaping advocacy. Um, um, and not homogenizing the community and its needs, if that makes sense. Um, Lemia? Yeah, thank you. I was literally going to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I think that it's really important to put the intersection between social class and, 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 and being a queer person, because we're talking about LGBT people here, but social class and being women, social class and like, uh, I don't know, like being migrants. Uh, it's there is there is a lot of layers that's really important to understand how you're going to perceive persecution and how you're going to live it as a person, because it's never going to be the same. Um, for sure, that uh, the reality in Morocco is that um, people from upper social class, they don't. Most of them, I had a lot of different discussions sometimes with like people that I met or even friends. They, for them, like LGBT rights are not. A necessity because it doesn't it doesn't bother them it's not a priority for them because they already have access to hotels they already have access to private space they already have access to jobs they already have access to visa they already have access to have uh, to travel so it's never a priority for them because it doesn't affect them which it's if you think about it it's totally normal it could even create problems for them. I had a discussion one time with a person who was like, well, actually, if you start like doing activism about, activism about LGBTQ rights, it's going to affect me because now they're going to check me when I go with my partner to a hotel. So it's it's really interesting how how uh, social uh, like um, social class is really important to understand. So the majority of time when, uh, for example, there is a backlash at least in Morocco, uh, against LGBTQ people, well, people who, who we target are basically uh, trans sex workers, most of the majority of the time. Um, uh, it's gonna be like people who are like, uh, their gender expression is not normative, which in a way that they're gonna be seen, they are more visible for the police, for the public in general. So it's never, um, people who are like fit in 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 certain categories that uh, that are kind of normative or okay even uh, even if you don't fit I would say like in your gender expression but you have enough money then you have access to space so 
I don't think that we can have a discussion uh, about the, the, the queer realities uh, in the region without understanding also the economics around it. I think it's really important. So yeah, and talking about what you said, like I do imagine, for example, tomorrow, uh, Morocco, uh, we are not gonna have any more the article 489 who is uh, like criminalizing LGBTQ people. Okay, good, great. And then what's gonna happen uh, is <laughs> people are gonna be arrested anyway because the police doesn't understand. They're gonna use different articles. Uh, people will be persecuted anyway because there is no access accessibility about what it is to be an LGBT person. There's a problem in education. There is a problem of, of a lot of misinformation, of a lot of uh, understanding of what it is being gender non-conforming in general or being queer so i think it's a, it's a, a societal uh, project <laughs> that needs different layers and not just one thank you lamia i feel that in one way or another you actually all uh, touched on what was going to be my second question um which was the um the link between socioeconomic conditions and moral panics in the Middle East. So I don't really think we need to necessarily go over this again, but I think what's really come out through what you're all saying is that, you know, this is not about um, necessarily about queer people, but about um, the political economy more broadly, right? There's a reason why we see um, uh, mass raids or mass arrests at particular times. They're not necessarily happening every single day. Um, um, and these often coincide with moments of regime instability, uh, economic instability, where you need to distract the population at large from policies that would cause mass outrage, essentially. And so you turn to the easiest scapegoat. You turn to not just um, queer, the queer community, but migrant communities, right, as well as the working classes. And if somebody's identity intersects across those um, different marginalized groups, then they will be the hardest hit, right? So like you're saying, Lamia, who actually gets arrested when a raid happens? It's often the most vulnerable members in the Lebanese context. Raids in terms of queer spaces, they the, the spaces that are targeted are either working class or spaces that are frequented by members of the trans community or spaces that are frequented by queer refugees, um, and spaces that are frequented by um, um, cis gay men of a middle class background who have Lebanese citizenship. These are often protected spaces, if not ignored spaces, if not protected spaces, right? Um, so I think we've all, you've all touched on this idea of the socioeconomics of moral panics, um, but something that's come up a little bit subtly in the conversation that it would be good to hear more about is the role that international actors play in affecting the lives of LGBT people in the region. I think this goes back nicely to what Nuro was talking about around the kind of like um, the monolithic understanding of the LGBT, LGBT community or viewing the entire community as the same, having the same needs um, across the region. But I'd love to hear more from all of you about what role you think um, international actors have played, particularly in exacerbating the, um, um, the marginalization of um, the LGBT community or communities in the Middle East and North Africa. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I just think uh, that I just want to also like just reflect very quickly on something that was said earlier. I think definitely uh, there is a very important uh, need to cross basically cultural approaches to uh, dealing with with the, you know with queer discrimination faced by the community. With a while, obviously, uh, very clearly and very straightforwardly acknowledging and recognizing the system systemic issues at play, and I think these two should be always like these two approaches and these two mechanisms should be uh, working in sync. And um, then, uh, in relation to uh, international actors, I'm going to be a bit critical, obviously, given living, living in Lebanon, which has witnessed, you know. To a certain extent, an increased civic space when it comes to um, LGBT activism, spearheaded by uh, a lot of these international NGOs, let's say, but also, and this is something I'll talk about a bit later, uh, international financial institutions. So I think when it comes to international NGOs, um, while the effort is recognized, I think uh, often a lot of the interventions do not hit the mark. A lot of the interventions are uh, kind of they sens sensationalize uh, what 
queer uh, means. And as you say, uh, and I think as, as Nora said and others, one group uh, where the, they do not take into account the local context and the local grievances. And when I say local contexts, I mean um, politically, in terms of the sectarian order, in terms of the economic order, in terms of the financial, the highly financialized system in Lebanon, uh, three crisis. And I think um, this often, when you just portray um, you know, uh, the LGBT community as just the main beneficiary of just some awareness campaigns or, uh, you know, uh, something that is more or less rooted in this idea of rainbow capitalism, with the, the politics of visibility, it often kind of, uh, in a way, also puts the community at risk. And this actually happened. And we saw uh, a lot of funding coming into uh, for, for, for campaigns on visibility and Beirut. And then there was a backlash from religious authorities, which kind of, in a way, resulted in an actual ministerial directive banning all LGBT-related uh, events and, and gatherings. So obviously, there is this kind of uh, ex negative externality of sorts. Um, and I think also uh, part of why, why I am generally critical of, uh, you know, uh, the internationalization of this uh, of, of, of activism uh, when it comes to the LGBT community in Lebanon is that often it kind of repackages itself uh, in the form of uh, neoliberal uh, economic relations because in a way it's kind of uh, it's it's really driven by neoliberal ideology because they, a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, you know projects or a lot of the uh, initiatives that are put forth by the, by these groups are really mostly rooted in this idea of entrepreneurship or marketization of queer people and let's economically empower these groups of people without at all acknowledging that there are systemic issues at play there are systemic there is systemic discrimination there is a law in place that that is being you know uh, uh, operationalized again and weaponized against against the community so it's it's nice obviously to have a few people uh, employed on the short term but i think at the end of the day uh, a lot of uh, a lot of queer people are still seen as imported vices, and and this kind of kind of perpetuates an exploitative economic relationship. And I'm generally like I I don't think I mean I, this idea of Western gaze, which is very relevant. I think I think we shouldn't stop there. I don't think it's just about uh, the West acting as the savior, which is often an, a narrative we hear. I think it's also about the West or international organizations. Um, empowering and strengthening and reaffirming this neoliberal economic relationship between queer people and the state between queer people i think this is super important uh, to, uh, to to acknowledge and recognize and finally because i mentioned earlier uh, um, on international financial institutions i think Okay, so and I think uh, following the financial crisis, Lebanon and the Lebanese uh, economic system turned into a heavily austere one, where a lot of people were not able to withdraw their money. Uh, there was a, an equity, a, a large uh, volumes of inequality in the, in the country. Um, so a lot of people had uh, had their income shrunk and had a lot of uh, had a lot of tax obligation had a lot of tax obligations had a lot of ex expenses, you know, and a triple digit inflation. And I think this is obviously austerity that we are seeing on the daily, but I think there is also austerity that comes from international financial institutions through, you know, this idea of structural adjustment, uh, where, okay, let's, let's reduce our spending, uh, which also means reducing spending on social welfare programs, reducing spending on health and education, which as Laura mentioned, is, is a crew, crew area, crucial area, sorry, uh, that's often kind of ignored. Um, and, and uh, in a sense, we are also uh, we have this regressive taxation system, meaning that um, people of and the low and the higher income brackets do not really bear the brunt of tax payments as opposed to um, as opposed to the lower income which uh, brackets which would host a big chunk of um, uh, queer people, especially trans folk who work in informal uh, informal sector sectors such as sex work and otherwise. Um, so, um, and I think this is super relevant now, just to conclude, because of Lebanon, you know, kind of awaiting uh, an IMF deal, and we're now working towards some negotiations with the International Monetary Fund, and we still see these, you know, policies, these neoliberal policies uh, being propagated, um, and 
well, to be fair, the IMF has acknowledged at some, at some point that they would like to have a greater focus on social safety nets. And, you know, they, there is, because they have been under the fire for, you know, because they have failed to recognize social issues and focused on macroeconomic reform. But recently, they have been just uh, hinting at this issue, but there is no specific, specificity uh, as to how this could materialize, how their, how their programs could actually feed into better social and economic inclusion. So I think, uh, grosso modo, uh, international actors have been doing some work in Lebanon, but it's far from enough. And at some points, it's actually also uh, causing some sort of regression when it comes to the movement itself. Thanks so much, Hassan. Um, would anybody else like to weigh in on the role of international actors? Yeah, hi. Yeah, I want to, to give actually concrete examples of when international actors actually harmed the movement in the MENA region more than actually helping it. Um, for example, in the last uh, World Cup in Qatar, with everything that happened with raising the flag in Qatar, even though they announced that the, it's going to be banned and everything, that actually did not do any, any good to the movement in the MENA region. Um, I'm sure we all know everything that happened afterwards, like, for example, in Algeria, how they banned games, toys for children just because they had the rainbow flag in it. Um, I know for sure many friends and activists, I, of course, I'm not going to name names or countries where they come from, but they had to flee their countries. They had to ask asylum abroad because um, that visibility would, did not work in, in our uh, benefit. And that's what happens when international actors decide to act without consulting with the actual community without um, talking with them and seeing what's needed uh, like on the ground and what it has to be to be done. And unfortunately that happens quite enough. Like it happens a lot of times when people would come and they want to apply whatever they had in their back home in your country without really understanding the context and the needs again. Um, we have many, many other examples for, um, for example, for us in Tunisia, we have a lot of problems to secure funds to provide financial aid for the queer community in here, because um, they will tell you they, they want to focus on the sustainability of the work. And they want you to like to do to provide trainings and so on for people to to become uh, sustainable and to have a source of income. But then when you think about it, if you live in a country where um, even your identity is criminalized by law and you don't have a shelter and you don't have access to health services and you don't have like the most basic rights, the most basic needs. I don't think providing a training for that person would would come as a priority, you see. So in some cases, they think they, that they're doing the right thing, but unfortunately, they are not. Um, in other cases, they can affect the movement, but unintentionally, without having the intention of doing it. Um, for example, for everything that's happening in the U.S. lately, uh, when it comes to the trans community and the ban of uh, drag art and drag shows, that is where we're starting to sense how that is affecting our work as well, because you will get the argument um, if in the US where freedom is like their motto, freedom is the, <laughs> is the thing they talk about all the time and the trans community is not free there and they still have a lot of backlash, a lot of issues why do you want to talk about the trans community in Tunisia and the MENA region? So like it, can, it comes in many forms, in many shapes, but even if we don't want it to exist and even if we sometimes want to deny it, but we're all related and we're all like a global movement that's, that's going forward, sometimes not uh, at the level that we want it to, but we're all related uh, one way or another. Thank you, Wima. Those were brilliant points. I really appreciate the also the kind of concrete way you you framed that for us as well. Um, Noura, Lamia, do you have any final thoughts on this um, this question of international actors? 
sure. Like I can, I, I will wait on like something Hussein and Waima said like that. It's they don't look into like the sustainable solution. Most of like the NGO, INGOs or Western like engagement in the region, like not only on LGBT issues, it's mostly like talks about like short term solutions. Like they don't look into the bigger picture. And I would say that there is not only like, you know, in every bad story, we always like to blame the West, especially as LGBT activists, but we have a lot of bad apples, you know, like it's just the reality. Like the LGBT movement itself benefit greatly from the human rights industry complex. Like uh, the gatekeepers of the movement are benefiting from this situation of keeping it a short term solution. Because they don't want to have a permanent solution. If they, if I give you a permanent solution, you don't dep- you are not depending on me anymore. If I say, for example, company X is based in the US, you work in IT and tech, and you give online courses. Oh, from my side, I will identify people who benefit from your online courses, and we can have a hiring agreement. Then it's an online everything online. They get high income because it's an American company going to pay higher rate than the average in the in your country and they will be sheltered from the bigger uh discrimination in the employment market do we do these solutions no because like again it does not benefit the gatekeepers of the movement and does not benefit the international ngos who want to continue on the western gaze that you are victim and need us is that this narrative you are a victim and need us exists in both ways lgbt movement in the region is also guilty of of like using this narrative on its own communities and this is why i said from the beginning when you talk about the lgbt there is no such thing about the lgbt as as the lgbt community there is you are a trans woman and something you are a cis gay man and something but there is no such thing as a community the community does not exist we are a society societies in the middle east and north africa and egypt and all we are classes society do not think for a moment because we are queer, we have absorbed ourselves from the sins of the bigger society. We are a reflection of the bigger society and we can be classes inside the society. So what I, INGOs can do, don't listen to one partner. Don't go to that one partner that you know in Lebanon or Egypt. They will tell you, do this, do that. And then you do this, do that. No, do, do your own context analyze, do your own research, go and do surveys. You have the resources to do that. You have a lot of government agreements. For example, UN AIDS in Egypt is capable of doing in-depth survey because of their unique position as saying that they only work on HIV. They can give us a lot of good data that me as like an LGBT NGO cannot perceive. Like I can get data from them on the number of uh, men who have sex with men who work in in the informal economy and how this impacts their access to HIV medicine. But at least I, I know who works there. But this kind of context analyze and like data collection suddenly does not exist. So we end up with mediocre programs that supposed to like empower LGBT people based on the opinion in one of one local NGO that like they consulted and they say like we did consult the local community because they talked to two people who are most of the time elitist and like do not care about like the benefit of the community. So please next time like maybe talk to like more than two people like maybe actually talk to at least 50, like do a decent sample and, re- and build your programming on that. Thank you, Nura. I think that is so essential, thinking about the, the need to also critique activism within the region, especially sort of NGOized activism that is, you know, and the idea of gatekeeping. And I think those things are so crucial and not talked about enough. Um, Lamia, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, because what Nora was talking about makes me also think about accessibility, accessibility to this kind of uh, of, of information in general. Um, because I would say that the, the the majority of not the majority, I don't like saying majority, but there is a lot of groups, LGBT groups, uh, in the region. I'll talk specifically about Morocco, who have no idea about how funding works, how they can get funding, how they can organize, how they can have access just like to basic information, uh, just like to have access to go to a conference, to network, to work. It's just how policy works, how how we can make a policy. How, it's very difficult because again, there is of course uh, gatekeeping, and there is of course there is of course also the the, the influence of uh, 
uh, international uh, funders and organizations who are making sure that those organizations are working through their uh, their eyes. Um, and I would say also that the, 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 the feminist movement also has been uh, using uh, LGBTQ people uh, here uh, in Morocco and uh, in, in a way or in another, in a way that they, they have never been uh, willing to work with the LGBT movement, but as soon as now it's uh, because it's more trendy and maybe there is more money behind it, uh, maybe they want to work on it, but there is no real strategy. How can they network? How can we create real alliance? How can we uh, think about it in a, in a, in a, context, a contextual way, uh, understanding uh, the culture, the values, and also the religious context of Morocco? So, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a big issue. Thank you, Lamia. I think you're all pointing to also the need to, when um, analyzing a particular form of queer activism, and I think this applies to any context in the world that one is looking at, asking what the political vision underpinning that activism is, is crucial, right? So beyond just services to a particular community, what kind of world is this activism aimed at contributing to? Um, what politics does it aim to dismantle? I think asking that question, actually, what is the ideology here? What is the vision is, is really important if you wanna disentangle some of these things. Um, so I'm very conscious of time. Um, we're, uh, we're running a bit over. Um, and I think this is a very good segue to ask you each about what you work on in terms of activism or research. Um, I will sadly have to ask you to keep your interventions to around two minutes. I feel I could listen to you all talk endlessly, but just so that we save enough time for the audience. Um, but I'll start off with the Hassan. So you've already touched on this a little bit, but I'd like to hear you kind of to describe further or talk more about the difference between um, a human rights-based approach to LGBT activacy versus one that is grounded in the socioeconomic. Um, so the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Um, so I think uh, this kind of yes, intersects with what I mentioned earlier on the need to um, I think you. I think Hassan is frozen. It's not just for me, right? Um, yeah, okay. Oh, there you are. We lost you. you. We lost you for a second. Yeah, yeah. Can you, yeah, yeah. I noticed. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. So I was saying that a socioeconomic uh, approach to LGBT liberation or rights in general allows us to go beyond uh, just uh, legal and you know focusing just on legal and, and civil rights allows us to go kind of dig deeper into this idea of socioeconomic inequality uh, and discrimination faced by the community uh, kind of really again uh, addressing and speaking to uh, systemic uh, uh, dynamics at play uh, so so this obviously means that we get to understand how different members of the community across different classes and races um, experience uh, poverty, limited access to healthcare, to education, to economic marginalization across the board. So, but this does not mean and it does not discount the importance of a human rights based approach, uh, because we do need this foundation, we do need this foundation that allows for an emphasis on legal and civil rights, um, but what we need really is to kind of start with this and to kind of really address the material conditions and the structural barriers that limit, you know, LG LGBT people from penetrating uh, the, the economy. Uh, so yeah, uh, because you mentioned just to stick to two minutes, I think, uh, yeah, these approaches are, are not mutually exclusive, but they should be kind of complementary, uh, so we could at least see some results in the short to medium term. Thanks so much, Hassan. Um, um, Noura, um, I'd love if you could tell us a bit about um, specifically, and you, you touched on education earlier, but about access to education for LGBT people um, in the Egyptian context. So how does education interplay with other factors that render LGBT ind individuals vulnerable? Why is it such an important part of advocacy and activism for you as well? I think 
Like we need to keep in mind, yeah, like in the Egyptian context, currently the education system is really crumbling. Like, and it has been like lagging, uh, lagging for years now. I think for decades even, like public education at least. So we already have a situation where like education is like good education is like only made available for upper middle class uh, and uh, upper class. So we already have this class system, and this class system, as I said, plays reflect on the LGBT community. But then we add a layer that. When did you come out? If you came out before finishing your education, then like most of the time, uh, you're not gonna complete your education because you're gonna have a lot of problems with family. Very rare that your family actually will support you to continue your education. So now you don't have a formal education. That's automatically put you on the bracket of the lowest income in Egypt, uh, automatically, because you don't have a formal education, you're gonna work the most odd jobs out there. If you finish it, your education, you come out anyway, and you're visibly queer, and this one visibility is like a, a, a is a disability in a sense. Uh, you you're not gonna be able to secure like certain em employment until like unless like you work in a, in a certain context that will allow you to. So we have these all of conditioning, like conditioning a, a life and so on. And as I mentioned before, like, I, again, like, uh, I don't understand programming that does not acknowledge the globalization that we live in. Now we are a globalized economy where you can earn more working remotely, even if, you, if you're going to, like, you're going to earn, like, $500, which is, like, nothing for, like, a European company. That's, like, higher than the average income. That automatically puts you, like, in, like, the top 80% earners in Egypt. So the idea here that I think like informal education is the way to go. I think we need more partnerships with educational institutions that do boot camps, like boot camps on like uh, coding, boot camps on like UXI, like all of this tech stuff that I don't understand. I think it's a good opportunity for us to explore because this is the this is something that really can help you like push your your portfolio forward education wise you now you're more high high educated like because like you know this technology and technical stuff and secondly like like it can protect you from discrimination in the public workspace and thirdly it makes you high earner so you can provide yourself and protect yourself from like the human rights abuses why does this not happen in in egypt and the region i have no idea to be honest this is like something that i really would like to uh, public uh, firms that do corporate responsibility every five minutes throwing money at like lgbt activists in the region and like just to take photo of them like raising rainbow flags at like i don't know like the square to for them to feel happy about please tell me what do you do actually to help the community the most marginalized within the community if grinder or facebook or WhatsApp, these are the big players, but they always like uh, claim that they are supporting LGBT people in the Middle East and North Africa. You can check their statements all the time. What are you actually doing to support them apart from throwing money at elitists? Are you supporting the community? Here, I give you a solution that is not hard. I don't think this solution is hard at all. Do this programming, give, give people online education that will make them top earners in their own context and partner partnership with local like american european uh, it companies they would love that it's like cost effective for them and help us like empower lgbt people and help them with their education so it's, it's a win-win solution but like but uh, apparently like it's still like we still need to argue on that and so on so we'll see if this type of solutions can be uh, applied in the future if it, if it will be that would be great but uh, until then we still live in the cycle of marginalization where like you don't have get education access to education is bad then like you don't get good employment then you, like you're more marginalized you're more vulnerable to state and social attacks uh, and like one aspect finally that like most queers in egypt from the lower income do sex work whether it's a survivor or they want to it's their their best income option and yet again, as a queer movement, we stigmatize sex workers so hard that they don't exist within our context, as if there is no such thing as a queer sex worker, because like we we are the uh, highest morality that exists out there, that no way that a queer can do sex work and so on. So all of this intersectionality that we need to talk about, like actively talk about, and stuff like putting our head in the dirt, 
and pretend that these things don't exist and these solutions don't exist and stop hitting uh, and stop pretending that the only thing that we need to care about is, uh, is culture and criminalization and so on. There's other things that can help and we need to find entry points for each of our contacts in the region that can work for INGOs and the community. Thank you, Nura. I think that tied really, uh, really well into what uh, Wima was saying earlier um, uh, with their critique of, um, you know, the way that international donors and funders relate to local activists, and I think really helped flesh out and get us thinking more about the distinction that Hassan was making and, you know, how we should be thinking about, um, you know, a queer rights approach that's grounded in the socioeconomic. Now, we have talked a lot about the socioeconomic, um, and I do have a question for both Lamia and Wima. Um, about the cultural, because I do think we can think of the cultural in different ways, right, in ways that is very compatible with um, this really important um, uh, critique um, that is grounded in sort of political economic analysis that we've been engaging in in this um, conversation. So Lamia and Wima, I'd like to hear from each of you about how um, you think cultural work can aid LGBT rights advocacy, um, and particularly how we can think of it in relation to uh, what both uh, Nura and Hassan were sharing about, um, about the importance of thinking socioeconomically. Um, so whoever wants to go first, feel free. Yeah, let me, you can go ahead. It's okay. I was going to say go, Wema, because you're literally having like a huge project on it. So I think you should start. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so there is one thing um, I love saying is that we're not here to change the culture as much as we're here to remind people of our real culture. Because um, the laws that we have that criminalize uh, homosexuality and the non-normative gender identities and so on in Tunisia, they were not put by Tunisians. They were actually uh, put by the French colonizers. And um, if we go back, um, try to find whatever is left from, from the history and what it, when, how it talks about the queer community, you, you will find out there were, mm, there were no issues. There were no real issues um, for people to actually um, think that they're not part of the Tunisian community. Like people used to live together and it was, it was fine. There were no issues at all about it. So we try to remind people about that, even when talking about religion, like we try our best. Um, and uh, is, there's something that we always focus on with Maujudin, which is artivism, art and activism because it is a very beautiful way to get through to, to people's hearts, honestly. It is kind of a, a manipulative uh, way to play on people's emotions and also to use it as an educational uh, tool. Um, for example, um, we have this play that we, we just had and it's going international now with Maujudin that's called Flagranti. And it talks about the actual situation of the queer community in Tunisia. First, we were really scared to have this as open for, for public to come in and watch it. But then we noticed when people come in and they watch this play and they, they see these stories and they see the reality and they learn about it, most of them did not even know what was going on. Like, we gained a lot of allies to the cause because people were not even aware about the laws that, that exist in Tunisia. People were not even aware that the queer community faces a lot of issues. They were just, we don't like them because, and that's it. They didn't, they didn't know what's happening in reality and the ground. And it was really, really important to, to get them to, to hear about these stories from the community itself. Um, and then we was talking about the big project, with it, which is the, the festival. Uh, and one of the things, when we, if I'm going to go back to the international uh, actors, is that at the moment, for example, even though it's a very successful event, and uh, we're having a lot of issues securing funds for the festival, because um, we've been told that art is not as important because it's not a priority, because we should focus on other things, because there are other needs that the community have in Tunisia and the MENA region. 
And this is like another example to explain how international actors in most of the cases do not understand the impact of the work that we do, aside from understanding the reality of, of things. So um, the festival is actually this huge event that we have for four days where um, we, we have films, we have panels, we have workshops and everything is related to the queer cause in the MENA region, not just for Tunisia, where people get to rethink the, the, the ways that we are approaching the movement and what we should do and how to move forward and so on. So, um, and then you find international funders like saying, it's not a priority. Yeah, we cannot give you money to have this. We cannot fund it anymore. And honestly, it's, it's really, really sad because Everybody that attended the event can talk about it for hours and tell you why it matters just to have this space to create the space for the community to come together and to and not just the community, even the allies joining us and being part of the movement and then having people saying, no, it, it's not important. Like it raises a lot of, of questions. Thank you, Wima. As someone who works on uh, a queer Arab cultural production, I'm very <laughs> sympathetic to your argument um, and completely agree with them with what you're saying. Thank you for sharing some of the work that that you've been doing in, in the Tunisian context. Um, Lamia, do you want to come in? Sure. Well, yeah, um, I think that's, I don't know, it's a difficult question because I almost my whole PhD was just around that. So <laughs> it's difficult for me to, to respond like in, in one sentence. Um, it's it's very difficult to, I don't know, like culture is really important, but it's also depends who is producing that and who is making it and for what exactly. For example, if we're talking about movies or books, I would talk about movies because they're kind of the most accessible uh, knowledge, cu culture, knowledge production, I would say for, for the majority or for the mass in general. It depends who is making them. Um, for example, I will give a specific example that is happening just now in Morocco. There is a movie uh, called um, uh, Le Bleu du Caftan, which is like the blue caftan uh, by uh, the Ayush uh, family in general that I have a problem with because they're upper class people who have been including LGBT stories in their movies. And it's uh, by the end of the day, they are creating, um, uh, I would say, stereotypes about uh, LGBT people. They are creating a problematic uh, vision about what it is to be a queer person in Morocco because they are just cis hetero people, heteronormative, not even like, this is not even a problem to be a hetero, of course, it's being heteronormative um, and, uh, and, and confusing like having this like uh, this uh, oriental way of understanding what is it being a queer person in, in, in the Arab world, I would say. Uh, and and putting that in a movie and selling it because I will put I will link that to to again uh, the neoliberal system where it's very interesting when someone from Morocco would make a movie uh, about LGBT people and sell exactly this exotic image about what it is to be a victim in a country where nobody likes you and they're gonna beat you and like it's this existed I don't know like it's 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 very problematic. It's very problematic because this is why I think that culture, of course, is important. It is uh, the vehicle of what we are as people in history, in general, as human being. But who is making this culture and who have access to produce this culture, who have access to be more visible? This is the question. And the majority of the time, it's not the people who, <laughs> who are facing this uh, the, the like the, the the persecution or the face in the realities the majority of the time it's people are like taking advantage of it and trying to make money from it so i think it's really important to to think about it in different ways thanks lamia i think that ties really nicely with what wima was saying right about the importance of you know the queer people themselves be, being able to produce their own cultural production you know, for themselves also as a community. Um, I think that that, you know, and given that a lot of either um, queer phobic um, representations of the community um, 
or kind of orientalizing portrayals of the, of the community are constantly being produced, right? So I think the importance of that production for the community's sake uh, that Wimo was pointing out, I think um, is really important. Um, so before we open it up to the audience, um, I'm just gonna pose a final question for each of you, um, really kind of an invitation to uh, build on some of the things you've already touched on. Um, so any final reflections on um, what kinds of structural changes are needed to better the lives of LGBT people in the Middle East and North Africa, or and um, what directions does <clears throat> queer advocacy need to go in, in your opinion, um, or what shape should it take in the region? Um, what directions would you like to see it go in? Um, so Hassan, I'll come to you first. Yeah, sure. I just want to check if my voice is clear because my internet has been a bit off. It's okay. Okay. So I think uh, something that came up a lot is that any sort of intervention by, by uh, activists or actors, whether external or internal, has to be intersectional. I mean, we need to recognize that there is an intersectionality in identities and in experiences um, within, within the space. So how factors like gender, class, even disability intersect with sexual orientation and gender identity and how these kind of uh, layers of, uh, of vulnerability often perpetuate this sort of oppression the community faces. I think this should come in hand in hand with legal reform up front. So advocating for comprehensive uh, laws that protect LGBT people, decriminalizing same-sex relationships, recognizing that these people exist, recognizing gender identity and ensuring, you know, just equal access to protections, labor protections, labor protections, but also legal protections. Uh, I think we obviously need to have more interventions focused on education access, on health access. Um, and I think this can only kind of uh, positively materialize if there, if there is some sort of contextualization of interventions. So, um, and this is, I guess, my last point, I know, uh, if actors have to kind of bring in funding or they want to work on initiatives or projects, this has to be, this has to go through, you know, uh, the queer community in Lebanon. And there are, there are mediums for this. I mean, we've, we've seen in Lebanon, at least, uh, there are mutual aid networks, uh, that are social, social solidarity networks that emerged following the pandemic. And often uh, funders are so disconnected from these modes of, of intervention. And, and also sometimes these mutual aid networks often try to, are very cautious when it comes to uh, funders because um, often they try to reshape the aims and the programming of such initiatives. So there should be this respect for of boundaries when it comes to you know uh, localized activism. Uh, in order to achieve better education, health, labor outcomes uh, across the board. Um, but yeah, these are some of my thoughts. Thanks. Thanks, Hassan. Um, Noura, any final reflections? I think like after, they, like I think like I would say the LGBT movement in Egypt started 15 years ago, maybe like the modern one, maybe like other countries had it for 20. And I think if, if we reach a point where we can't even have a sustainable legal aid program, we have a problem. We just have a problem. Like if you can't even have a sustainable grassroots community or uh, service and you're still taking money every year, you have a problem. Your strategies are low. There is a problem with your strategy. It's the moment for self-reflection. Let's think like, let's think about this as a business. If you're, in, if you're running a business and you reach a, more, a time where like you see that you're not making profit a year after year after year, you will restructure your business. It's time for us to restructure our our business, which is the LGBT rights business. Uh, and like, look at our strategies, like build our strategies, like our earlier strategy were built based on like Western understanding of like how LGBT rights should be like um, established. It's time for us to conduct evidence-based research, do better data collection, uh, and like with these like methods, est establish uh, something based on our context, a strategy that based on our, on our context that can work in our context. We should not follow blindly the, the Western gaze, like we should not follow blindly the elitist. We should listen to the people. And I would rather listen to the very marginalized individual because they are, are the one who have nothing to lose. Like they are like already lost everything. Like they need that. 
uh, than like an activist who have a U.S. visa under a passport and uh, they can like do whatever they want and like travel to the U.S. whenever they want. They will get, they don't really have an understanding of the risks and so on. And I understand that some people will call me hypocrite doing that from the comfort of my house in Berlin. And that's why you should not listen to me. You should listen to the data, do your evidence-based research, go do your context analyze and listen to the community. The activist is the last person you review with. Like the activist is the last person you go to and ask them, do you think the we can establish this based on the community and so on? You can involve the activists in the decision uh, process, but they are not the one responsible for making the final decision. Because as I said, most activists in the region, from my experience, are having a comfortable position within the society and do not feel the pain of the people. It's time for us to like just echo the voices of the community. So that's, I think this is the main strategy that I would follow now, like context analyze, data collection, evidence-based research, building strategies based on all of that and follow the marginalized voices and not follow only the, again, the two people that you talk to who like live abroad or like, or so on. Like, it's just like, I am like still burning myself. Like I know, but like in the same time, I'm just saying that our 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 job as activists or like uh, scholars or researchers is to echo the voices of the community, not to determine what the community wants based on our own opinion. If you don't base it on analyze and uh, research, then you are basing it on opinion. And so far, I, I I would like ask people like, did you see how many NGOs in the region actually told you we'll do that based on research and not just the opinion of like some Western NGO or like the executive director of the group? That's it. Thanks so much for that, Noura. Um, uh, Wima, would you like to come in with final reflections? Yeah, I just, um, <laughs> I think I'm gonna rephrase what Noura said um, a bit differently, maybe. I would say um, that activists do have privileges that we can use uh, for the community. Um, most of the activists, they're educated. They, like Noura said, they could travel, they have, easier access to visa, I wouldn't say complete access to visa because um, we still face a lot of issue because of our activism actually to get um, visas when we need to travel or when, when we want to travel for the simple reason. I would say we have certain privileges that we could use to help the community and our role is um, to speak when other people do not have the security, the safety, the courage, maybe the space uh, to speak up and to say what they need. So we're kind of like the bridge between the community and we are part of the community ourselves. So we do understand um, the needs, but not the needs of everybody. That's when researchers come that trying to include as many people as needed. Uh, when it comes to changes, I would, I would I have a long list. I don't think I have enough time to talk about all the changes that needs to, to take place. But maybe I would mention things that were not mentioned by others, like the, um, the health uh, services, which is a big, big, big issue, especially when talking about non-normative um, gendered uh, people in Tunisia. I'm sure it's the same thing in, in the MENA region. Access to health services is like almost impossible uh, for the trans community, for example. And um, then talking on how related to, to the economical aspect, we do not have enough money to go to private doctor if you cannot access um, the hospitals that the government is supposed to provide to you, we do not have money and we will not be able to pay for, for these services. So everything is kind of related. And also the educational aspect of it when talking about um, sexual and reproductive health and rights and talk and relating it to the educational system. It's very heteronormative and if it exists in the first place, <laughs> this education, it is very, very heteronormative and it's not inclusive. And most people from the queer community, they do not know how to approach um, sex and how to approach reproductive health and rights, which is um, 
which is very, very sad. And it kind of affects everything else, like mental health. And yeah, it's like a snowball effect. Um, but yeah. Thanks so much, Wima. Um, Lamia, any final reflections? Yeah, well, I, I do believe in, in micro resistance uh, and I do believe in research. I, I would say like, for me, there's two things that are very important to, to make a change. In, in, in a very difficult time where like, um, <laughs> We cannot change the word. The word is corrupt. It's it's a very difficult to live. There is a lot of issues. There is environment issues. There is neoliberalism. There is capitalism. There is poverty and there is racism. There is so many things. So at some point, as like a researcher and also as an activist, I can see myself like, or I see myself that happens to me in many moments where I'm like, oh my god, but what can I do? I cannot do anything. Like I just becomes pessimist. So this is why I do believe in micro resistance uh, in uh, in different ways. Uh, sometimes we cannot really change policy, but at least we can change one idea with other people. Uh, we can change just one idea in the discussion. It doesn't need to be a fight. It doesn't need to be a huge argument. It could be just like through empathy, uh, through like just discussion <laughs> or communication. And I do believe that micro resistance are possible through the, not just like in the LGBT movements, but in general in human rights. Um, I believe in research because <laughs> as Nora said, uh, evidence-based research is for me like one of the basic tool to understand what's happening in our context. So we can try to, to do, um, I would say like to understand so we can do different in a different way, because it's almost impossible to do any change if we don't listen to each other and if we don't understand exactly what are the realities of, of our context. And I would say that what happens a lot, um, that activists live in a small bubble where they only talk to each other, when they only understand each other and they even have specific words that are technical that someone who is outside of this bubble cannot understand. So at some point we start believing what we say in this bubble as being the only reality, which is not true. There is different realities. And this is why it's very important to go outside of the bubble to do research and to try also to do micro resistance outside of these bubbles. So yeah, this is uh, this is what I have to say. Thanks so much, Lamia, and thanks so much, everyone, for um, these amazing reflections and interventions. So we have fifteen minutes to take questions from the audience. We have about ten questions slash comments right now, um, and so feel free to write more questions or comments in the Q and A box, um, and we will try to get through as many of these as possible. Um, so the first question, I, I suppose, is for any of you, um, and it says, how do donor, donors and partners mobilize and empower LGBT communities in high-risk locations such as Sudan, Somalia, and Yemen? Can you provide examples of successful initiatives in these contexts? Um, would anybody like to address that? like in a humanitarian context where you have like an active conflict going on or a crisis going on i think it's a, it turns into like more of a question of like humanitarian assistance and so on more like that how you can establish lgbt rights or lgbt specific empowerment uh and i think like it's quite hard in these two specific contexts to understand how lgbt people are being treated or how their livelihood is like because again Humanitarian groups like and like this, giving the context as well, cannot collect data specifically on LGBT people because imagine like going and asking someone, "Are you gay?" in in a Yemeni context, and uh, the the response will will either very really be like very aggressive or very defensive, or you will be labeled the homosexual uh, group working in Yemen to produce like. Uh, uh conspiracy against uh lgbt people and so on so i would like 
go around and say that in this context, like these two specific contexts, it's just that we don't know what is going on for LGBT people to actually do any programming on it. It just this is the reality. We have no data. Uh, that uh, the, like even like if we talk about elitist uh, activists, we don't even have that. Like we don't have people from uh, at least like if they are second generation. Uh, Yemeni American or Somali British and so on, and then they did not experience like like the things back home. Like they have the ethnic background, but they don't have the experience component that will help you understand the situation. So I think like in these contexts, two specific contexts, I think it's just that we need to under, under uh, start with the basics and just first figure out what's happening there for LGBT people and then start pro building program. But I wouldn't say that there is any successful LGBT specific programming that have happened in these two contexts, not on, the, uh, on any scale that I know of at least. Thanks, Noura. Does anybody else wanna weigh in before we move on? Okay, um, so the next question um, I uh, believe was in reference to something uh, Lamia was saying in her earlier um, interventions. So. The question reads, my question is, how do we as a queer movement in the region get funders to understand that addressing the, these root socioeconomic issues is what's most pressing and that addressing these issues is what will, what will reflect the most positively in the lives of LGBTQI plus people in the MENA because they still seem to just not get it. Um, so Lemia, I don't know if you wanna answer first since this seems to have been in response to what you were saying in your original interventions, I believe. Yeah, well, I think, I think, I think it's the, the 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 LGBT movement or any movement, any human rights movement. So we are talking about LGBT here specifically. Um, needs to have, uh, I would say, the the arguments and the data so they can uh, pursue like or, uh, with uh, the, their projects. And I do believe that founders don't have. Uh, power on 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 activists. I believe that activists have power on funders, but it doesn't work like that the, mo the majority of the time. I believe that it's possible to do projects without money. There is many projects that is possible to do without money. There is many projects that it's possible to do through collaboration. There is many projects that is possible to do through uh, just like alliances with different uh, groups or people or individual or organization or art or whatever. I think it's really important to think outside of the box. If it doesn't work with some founders, just say no, work with others. If it doesn't work with them, find another way. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's an, it's an option. Anybody else like to Wima? Yeah, I totally agree with the, what Lamia said. Um, here comes the the importance of data, of having the uh, information and the research work like showcasing what, what the queer movement and the region actually needs. But I would add additionally, the, the lobbying work here is also very important. Uh, getting the message through to, um, to funders and tell them, hey, this is what, what you should focus on. This is what you should actually um, fund. The, this is where your money should go as well. Uh, and then if they don't listen, they just say no. <laughs> Let's not like run after money just because it's money and take it to to do any project that's not really adapted to the context that we live in. Because in many cases, that's unfortunately what's what's have been happening. Um, and have the power because we are the ones who understand the best the context that we we're in, and we're the ones who understand best um, what's needed in the region. Thanks, Wima. Um, anybody else want a final thought on that before we move on? Okay, um, so we actually have a question from someone who's part of the uh, a part of uh, Queer Mutual Aid Lebanon, which San mentioned um, uh, at some point when he was speaking. Um, so the question reads, because of the economic collapse and lack of any employment support opportunities afforded to queer and trans people in Lebanon, our work has become almost entirely about providing sustainable financial aid to members of our community. We are also all too burnt out to think beyond the immediate needs. Do you have any thoughts about how such a network could expand to include more political, social, and cultural demands? What form could those demands even look like? 
Um, there, a link has also been provided to the group's Patreon, but Audrey, I don't know how to share from the Q&A box to the audience at large. If you could do that, that would be that would be great um, while, um, while the panelists take the question. So does anybody want to weigh in on that question? Um, I could I could uh, kind of uh, just talk a bit about that. Um, thanks, Ayman, um, for the question. Uh, and I think I think it's obviously not an easy task, uh, particularly for the reasons we have been talking about uh, about how you know uh, queer activism or activism pertaining to the community is you know operationalized in Lebanon, and also particularly because of you know uh, moral panics so sometimes as you mentioned there is this sense of burnout uh it's a bit it's a bit of a difficult exercise to really think beyond just you know uh, the very humanitarian lines of intervention but i think um because of what i mentioned earlier because there is an increased interest and in, uh and uh, you know supporting the lgbt community especially for example after the Beirut explosion uh, we saw a lot of actually organizations coming in with, with the very pro lgbt agendas which obviously had its uh, kind of own uh, downsides but in, in the sense of how uh, it also created some sort of backlash but i think again because there is this increased interest i think um uh, this is one of the recommendations I had suggested. It would be good if these actors actually sit with, uh, sit down with people like yourself uh, and other members of the mutual aid network and other mutual aid network, or at least to actually recognize that these networks exist. Because actually, from conversations with donors, with other uh, actors, uh, uh, development actors, whether local or otherwise, a lot of these actors do not actually know. Uh, of the of this network, and I also, if they do know, their immediate reaction is uh, is often less so on the political, social end, and the systemic issue of you know of how to, uh, why we are where we are. Um, so I think uh, as soon as we are able at least to have these one-on-one di -on -one dialogues with these development actors, I think this is an opportunity to kind of. Um, push the movement or push the initiative or other similar initiatives a bit more. And I think one last issue is that I think some queer-led organizations um, and even businesses have been, um, have been kind of working on uh, supporting uh, queer people in different capacities, some in research data-specific capacities, other in terms of, you know, uh, promoting safer spaces, I think, Having uh, like in terms of businesses or, or, or collective space, collectives, etc., having some sort of uh, you know unified dialogue amongst all of these actors allows for this political, cultural, and social conversation to emerge, uh, which obviously the the mutual aid network could partake in. But obviously, just to conclude, I think this is a very difficult exercise, uh, very multi pronged, and I think it will require a lot of effort, especially amidst crisis. But it is one of the, I guess, medium term ways we could see this materializing. Um, thanks so much, Hassan. Um, would anybody else like to weigh in on this before we take one last question? Wima? Yeah, um, maybe what I'm gonna say is not um, what I mean, <laughs> would be expecting, um, but I cannot like stop reading too burned out to think, too burned out, too burned out. It's also very important um, sometimes to understand our limits and to know um, how far we can go and how much we can do. So it is totally okay to just focus on what you're doing and maybe call for other NGOs, other groups, other formal or informal groups to, to take care of the other aspects. Like we don't have to do everything. Um, yeah, just also um, because the two burned out thing keeps keeps flashing in front of my eyes. I'm like, your mental health also matters because if you get too tired, you will not be able to do anything afterwards. So 
it's fine to know when when to stop and when to say this is everything that I can do and that's it. Thanks, Mima. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, uh, there are, by the way, your for the audience, your comments to all of us are visible to all of the panelists. So thank you to the for the very rich comments that you've provided. And I'm sorry that we haven't had time to engage with them in depth. Um, but we did get a question which I think comes up a lot um, in terms of talking about queer activism anywhere, which is what are the alternatives uh, to visibility? Um, or, and I think this often, um, you know, there's always this tension that I think people point to between the need for a particular kind of visibility and then the critique of visibility politics. I think we talked a lot about the limitations of visit visibility politics. So maybe I can invite you to give some final reflections on that before, before we end in response to that question. So what are the alternatives to, to visibility, I suppose was the question. I would maybe say, okay. yeah, does, does visibility need to be a good or a bad thing maybe? So maybe what do we mean when we say visibility could be a different way of thinking about that? Sorry, Hassan, go ahead. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, visibility as a, as a kind of, uh, as a mechanism uh, for relieving kind of the community from oppressive structures as an instrument, right? So, and creating uh, inclusive uh, markets or jobs is also another instrument, and reforming laws is also another instrument. So, I think these are all different instruments that should be part of a broader agenda for how we see uh, our liberation looking like. But I think. Uh, I don't think it's about is it the right time to actually operationalize visibility as an instrument and 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 severely uh, strained uh, economies like the economies we're in, and also which kind of intersects with what was mentioned earlier and the accompanying moral panics that kind of come with. Um, obviously, it's, it would be ideal if we are able to celebrate. Uh, these various, the very diverse identities as a way of, you know, reclaiming power and reclaiming economic and political and social, you know, strength. But I think often um, visibility does more harm than good, at least, for example, in Lebanon. And I think it's fine to be, uh, you know, to be visible and to, to engage in visibility politics, but I don't think it's enough to just say, queer or like add a rainbow flag and then stir a conversation on liberation because i think this is this can be dismissive uh, of the various economic and social structures so i think there is uh, actual economic and political reform that should kind of um, uh, be the um, larger and wider umbrella so again speaking very loudly in the face of oppressive uh, systems that we live in and then even when we do that, and even when we reach a situation where there is some sort of economic reform or economic recovery or inclusive economies of sorts, this, is, this does not even guarantee that, okay, religious institutions or, 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 or uh, you know, um, tradition or culture, when it's done, says that when you legalize same-sex relationships or when you... Uh, engage in more visibility then there are better economic outcomes and this is this is this can be validated by data in other contexts but often in our countries it could have a regressive effect that's why we, we've been talking a lot about uh, what are the structural and some or some some were mentioned earlier what are the structural reforms that are needed that should precede this or at least go and sync depending on the context with this effort but yes uh, I think that's that, that's the main thing Take away. Thanks so much, Hussein. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, for such an amazing discussion. It's, I'm I'm really sad to have to wrap it up, but I'll hand over uh, hand over to Audrey now.
Thank you so much, Noura, Dr. Damia, Hussein, and Wima for such an important conversation. And thank you, Sophie, for seamlessly moderating this very dynamic discussion. I really appreciate it from all of you. Um, I just want to mention before we close out that this conversation is part of a larger commitment and body of work by Time Up on gender and sexual rights, including its intersections with other critical issues across the MENA region. So I really invite you to explore our work on Time Up's website, timeup.org, and to follow Time Up, as well as each of these excellent panelists you've heard speak today on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, across different social media platforms to stay engaged with our work and theirs. Um, thank you so much to our audience for joining and contributing so much to the discussion. These conversations are never the same without your engagement. Um, and finally, a huge thank you to the Time Up team who made this event possible. Have a wonderful day, everyone.